title of my message today again, Wherever He Leads, I'll Go. Boy, you ought to really look at those words that, that you just sang. Do you mean it? Is that true for your heart? I hope so. As I talked about last week, in, in order to uh, face the future, we need to understand the past. And if we understand what the church needs to do and ought to be doing in the 21st century, we need, need to look back and see what it did in the 1st century, century, and we'll know what we ought to do today. And so let's look here in Acts chapter 8. Uh, well, we'll read a couple of verses, verse 26 in just a moment. But our, we're, we're continuing the message from last week. And um, may we all here this morning be able to say and mean it, wherever he leads, I'll go. Let me remind you, it's good to have the young people in here this morning. I like to have you guys over here from time to time. Uh, you're usually over there in the fellowship hall under lock and key. No, okay, we don't lock them up or anything, but it is good to have you here. And I want you to know, young people, just as well as any adult here, God is calling you. God has a plan for your life. And wherever he leads, are you willing to say, Lord, I'll go, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Every one of us who are saved here this morning, you're a missionary. I don't know if you remember last week, I kind of asked you that trick question, but we're all missionaries. You know, God may not be calling you to cross the Atlantic Ocean. God may not, may not be calling you to the pulpit. But my point in this message this morning is that God is calling all of us to do something. And so I want to encourage you to follow uh, God's will for your life. The times that we live in today, to put it mildly, are desperate. But the problem is, many of God's people are not desperate. Uh, some of us are living as though, ah, this is just the way it is. This is the way things are. We, we don't have an urgency uh, in trying to get the truth of God's word out. And so I pray that God would stir our hearts today. Let's, let's look down at verse 26 here in Acts chapter 8. Here we find uh, Philip being called by God. And, he, and it says, an angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, queen of Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in the, his chariot, read Isaiah's, the uh, prophet, or Isaiah, that's who it's speaking of there. Then the Spirit said unto uh, Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And I love Philip's response. He ran. Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? We'll stop there for right now. Let's, let's again one more time just have a word of prayer and ask God to have his way. Father, do work in hearts. There could be someone that's not saved here this morning. And um, I, I pray that you would help him to hear, to understand, Lord, to act upon your invitation to receive uh, eternal life. And so we work in that heart here today. And Lord, again, just have your way for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So first of all, if you will be used of God, and if you will be able to get to the place where you say, wherever he leads, I'll go, then number one, you must answer God's call. God's calling, are you answering? The phone's ringing. Now, I, I said last week, when I was a kid, if the phone rang, we all made a charge for it. We wanted to be the first to answer the phone. And uh, when that phone rings, I've seen how some of you respond. Uh, you are almost controlled by that phone. And it, it rings, you answer it. Uh, though some of us that have been around a while, we are a little more cautious of some of these calls because we know they're selling something. But God is calling you, and you've been ignoring that call. And God will use you. He has a plan for you just as he had a plan for Philip here. An ordinary person, Philip was, but God used him in an extraordinary way. And you say, well, Pastor, I don't have any great gifts and abilities like many others do. Oh, listen, God didn't or is not only calling the gifted and those with great, what we would classify as great abilities, 
Look, if you and I make ourselves available to God, God can use an ordinary person to do extraordinary things. And so God's, you know, we talk about God working in our lives and how God does that. First of all, we mentioned how God's ways are often unknown. Philip didn't get the rundown here exactly what was going to happen. He said, Philip, I want you here. Go. Okay. Yes, sir. He didn't know. He had sealed orders as he was going here to do what God had called him to do. And uh, so must we. Sometimes we want everything laid out before us before we're going to act on it. And uh, we just don't have the faith. But God's ways are often unknown. God's ways are often unexplained. And again, uh, Philip didn't have any explanation what was going to be taking place, but he obeyed. And so not only must we answer the call, that's the first thing, we did, to acknowledge God's calling, I answer, hear my Lord, send me, as Isaiah said. Secondly, acknowledge God's message. When God calls, God has a message. It's not like you and I have to come up with some idea, well, what, what, what am I going to say? Uh, what am I going to, uh, uh, you know, talk about? No, God has given us the message here. And you acknowledge that what this message is. You know, there's a lot of folks who call themselves missionaries, and they're out there today, they're, they're building buildings, they're digging wells, they're planting crops, they're educating people, and all of that. And folks, that's good, that's fine. And, and uh, if, if that gives an opportunity for that uh, person to preach the gospel, praise God. But if not, then it's a colossal failure as a missionary. Uh, missionaries, it's great to do all of those things. That's a part of their work, but that's not the main thing God's called them to do. What good is it if we feed the world and ignore their soul? I think it's good that we can feed the people that we can and help the people that we can. But what good is it if we neglect the most important thing? And so that's what a missionary is supposed to do. Now, we have some people today who are preaching what we call liberation theology. And all that is is socialism with a little bit of religion sprinkled on top of it. And they're not preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I, I want you to understand what a real missionary does. I want you to see what Philip did right here in Acts chapter 8. It's very exciting here. Look at verse 30, if you would. Philip ran thither uh, to him. Philip understood the urgency of the hour, the, the moment that God called and reacted to his call. And he heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? Now, underscore that phrase if you do that in your Bible, because that is our job right there, to make the word of God plain. Now listen, we are not really, in the truest sense, soul winners. Now listen to this, the Holy Spirit is the soul winner. You see, he is, our, he is a soul winner uh, that's working through us, and to that degree, we are soul winners. But the Holy Spirit is the one that does the work. And our job is not to be successful. Our job is to be faithful. Some people have the idea, they okay, they say, oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go talk to people about the Lord. I'm going to be a witness. And they talk to one person, and that person doesn't want anything to do with it. And they shut them down. And they say, well, I tried. I guess I, I'm just going to have to quit. No, God did not call you to uh, only to see success. God called you to be faithful. And the more faithful we are in being the witness we ought to be, you will see fruit from that, that labor. But our job is to be faithful. Our job is to make the message clear and, and to help people understand what God's word is saying. And they can't understand unless someone shows them. Uh, look, look again here in Acts chapter 8, verse 30. Understandest thou, Philip asked this man, this Ethiopian eunuch, said, you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I except some man should guide me? Now, as a side note, did you notice here that it was an angel that said to Philip, uh, arise and go toward the south? That was an angel. Why didn't God send the angel to tell this man in this chariot? <clears throat> Why didn't God send the angel to tell this man how to be saved? And because angels can never testify of salvation. Did you know that? They've never experienced it. 
And uh, they've never had it. Angels never, uh, they don't know the joy that you and I know, Christian, of, of salvation. And, uh, that, and that what, what salvation brings. We are privileged to do something that angels cannot do. We are privileged uh, to do something that, in fact, we will not be able to do when we get to heaven. And that is lead souls to Christ. Can't do that. I, our, our work, our labor will be over. And so what a great opportunity we have before us. I know it seems even more so today, it's easy to focus on all the perilous times that we live in. And we get consumed with that. And boy, we can become very cynical and, and hard-hearted. And we need to be careful of that. But we need to understand this is a, a golden opportunity for us to see, to lead people to Christ. People are out there searching for truth. Now they see the hypocrite. Oh yes, they, they'll point them out and, and uh, they'll see those that are not real, but they need to see someone that is real. They need to hear from God's word. I like what Brother Morris said in Sunday school class. Boy, can you imagine if the word of God is being read to the entire nation of America? Just piping it in their homes all day long. You know, the, the Muslims, they're what is it, three, four, five times a day, they're, uh, they're blowing those loud, noisy things to call to prayer, and, and they're, you hear all the, the, uh, the language, and it's, you hear that all the time. But uh, would to God, people would hear the word of God. You know, that's what God has called you and I to do, is to get the word of God. It's not our message. It's not our words, it's God's word. It's the message that God has given us. And so I, I hope you understand what I'm saying here as far as being a soul winner. It's the Holy Spirit that does the work through us. And, um, but we are doing something that even angels cannot do. Uh, we must answer the call. Look, look what this man says here uh, in verse 31. And he said, how can I? When, when Philip asked him, did he understand? He said, how can I? except some man should guide me. And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the uh, scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. What a coincidence. Just so happened to be read. No, no. God is orchestrating all of this. If Philip had not obeyed when he did, had not acted like he did immediately, he would have missed this opportunity. And so he, he goes on, he says, reading this, um, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shears, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speakest the prophet this? Who is he talking about here? Have you ever, as you're reading the Bible, I'm sure you've had some similar questions. You're not sure who it's talking about. Well, the eunuch did. And he says, of himself or of some other man. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at that same scripture to preach unto him who? Jesus. That's right. Let's try that again. Who did Philip preach unto him? What was his name? Jesus. Jesus, Jesus Christ. And that's what Philip preached. And we must answer the call of God. We must acknowledge what the message that God is that, or is that he has given us acknowledge God's message, Philip opened his mouth and began to preach the scripture, the same scripture, and preach unto him Jesus. He didn't preach about race, though this man was a different race. He didn't preach to him about the economy. He didn't preach to him about the social and the political situation in Ethiopia. Uh, he preached unto him Jesus. You have the message. You know the message, Christian. And so there's three points to the gospel I want to give you this morning. Three things that help this Ethiopian eunuch understand. And these are three things that I want you to understand today, especially if you're here and you're not saved. You need to understand these three, the message here that Philip preached unto this Ethiopian eunuch. And if you are saved and you want to see someone else be saved, then it's, uh, it's so simple. There's just three things to know. When you hear somebody preach the gospel and they make it so complicated and then you know that 
probably God is not in this uh, because the gospel is not complicated. God wants even a child to understand the gospel. I mean, the gospel, as someone put it, is simply glorious and gloriously simple. And so when somebody is preaching the gospel and you say, man, that guy must really be intelligent. He must be a real smart guy because I didn't understand a thing he said. No, wait a minute. That, that shouldn't be. Now, when it comes to the gospel, our job is not to try to impress others with how much we think we know. Our job is not to impress others with some words that we may have learned in vocab and uh, we're trying to show our intelligence. Our job is to make it simple, easy to understand, clear. That's what Philip did. He said, you understand? No. Well, here, let me show you. And he preached unto him Jesus. And so uh, there are three simple things here. By the way, I, I, look what the Bible says about Jesus. No, just listen to this. We won't turn there. In, in Mark chapter 12, verse 37, it says, the common people heard him gladly. Yeah, that's talking about Jesus. Jesus, who's all knowing. He says, there's no one wiser, more intelligent than Jesus, and yet all the common people heard him gladly. That means they understood, gladly. They heard him. And here was Philip making known to this Ethiopian uh, a man, the gospel. There, there's three simple facts in Philip's message that ought to be in the message that we're giving out today. Just three simple things. Um, and number one, Philip showed this man that he was a sinner. Now we know, you know, that's a simple truth. He showed this man that Jesus Christ died for his sins. This uh, same 53rd chapter of the book of Isaiah where this Ethiopian is reading I, uh, uh, Philip goes to this particular passage there in verse 6, and I'm sure he shares with him, all we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. There's no doubt in my mind at all that Philip took him to the remedy of the problem. Yeah, we're all sinners, but let me show you the remedy, the cure. And uh, why, why the Lord Jesus died like a lamb to the slaughter, Isaiah is prophesying of. He was dying for our sins. Nobody, 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 and I emphasize that word nobody, is ever going to get saved until they come to the place where they admit, they acknowledge, they understand that they are a sinner. And, and so uh, that's the first thing, admit that uh, he or she is a sinner. Now, in the average congregation, there's two classes of people who don't get saved. And maybe you're here today. There are those who think they're too good to get saved. They think that the gospel is for that thief or that prostitute or that murderer or that really bad person. Not for me. They don't, they think the gospel, they, oh yeah, maybe for that uh, alcoholic or that drug addict, but not for me. And uh, they don't think the gospel is for them because they're nice, they're cultured, they're dignified, they're educated, or whatever the, uh, they may, may say about themselves. They don't, they, they don't think they need to be saved. Then, on the other hand, there's people who think they're too horrible to get saved. I mean, they're terrible sinners that God won't have anything to do with in their thinking. And they think, oh, I wish I was like that nice religious person. That person that seems to have everything together. But I'm just, a, I'm out of it. God won't have anything to do with me. That's, that's the two classes of unsaved people in churches today. Now listen, friend, there is nobody so good that he need not get saved. And there is nobody so bad that he cannot be saved. Amen? I mean, it's no, no nobody. I don't care you may think you're the best of the best, and you might be the best of the best on this earth, but you're still way off the mark when it, in comparison to Jesus Christ. You're still a sinner in need of a Savior. And there's nobody, I've heard people tell me this before, old preacher, if you knew what I've done, 
you wouldn't think I could get saved. Yes, I don't care what they've done. If they will repent and turn to God, they can be saved. And so, but we have to understand what the Bible says. For all, Romans 3, 23, for all have what? Sin. All have sinned and come short. That's right, Cooper, come short in the glory of God. We have to understand that Christ died for our sins. I read about this uh, funny, uh, well, it wasn't, I guess some people didn't think it was funny. I kind of thought it was humorous. There was a beauty contest in England, and they were using this beauty contest to promote their product, whatever that was, but it was a, a very unusual contest uh, because it was for women who were over 40 years old. And they had a wonderful prize they were going to give the winner of this pageant, but no one won the prize. Now that's odd. They said that, uh, and here's the reason why, nobody who entered this contest wanted to admit that they were 40 years old or older. And uh, so they, uh, not, not a one of them, they couldn't get anybody in the contest, they couldn't, they couldn't even get them to enter because they did not want to acknowledge that they were 40 years old or, or born. Even if they were very beautiful and, uh, and had, they could win the prize, that didn't matter, they would not admit it. I thought that was interesting because there are some people who will never possess salvation, the greatest gift ever offered to mankind. Because they will not admit that I'm a sinner. They will not admit that they're sinners. And therefore, they'll never possess salvation. Now, I, I don't mean just admit it, by the way. But acknowledge it before God. Oh, God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. Friend, you're a sinner by birth. You're a sinner by nature. You're a sinner by choice. A sinner by practice and the wages of sin is what death. death that's right and philip made known to the ethiopian that christ had died for his sins and you won't get saved until you admit that um, there's an old story of a king who was visiting a, a slave galley ship and you know on this ship is where they would send the criminals and they would chain them to those great oars underneath the deck and they would be uh, uh, the motor, uh, the engine for, for that ship uh, moving across the water. And they didn't have a choice. And this was their punishment. It was a prison, prison ship. And so this king visits this ship, and he wants to talk to some of the criminals to find out what their crimes were, what they were guilty of. And uh, so he, this king, he goes to the first one of the first men. He says, why are you here? And the man says, sire, I'm, uh, I'm here, not really by my fault. Says that the reason I'm here is because I was framed. I'm not guilty, sire. And that's uh, and the king says, oh, that's a shame. That's a shame, downright shame. And he goes on and he talks to the next man. He says, why are you here? Oh, he said, your honor, I, I'm like the other man that just spoke to you. He said, I'm innocent. He said, I was simply in the crowd where a crime was committed and they took us all. I'm innocent. And he said, oh, the king says, that's tragic. That's a tragic thing, my man, that, then, uh, 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 that you should go through this kind of a situation. And then he went to one man after another, and they all had a similar story. And yeah, I'm innocent. No, I'm framed. But until he came to one, one man, and he said, and why are you here? And the man answered, sire, I'm here because I'm a criminal. I have sinned against my God. I have sinned against my king. I have sinned against my fellow man, and now I'm suffering the just reward for my deed. When the king heard this, an interesting response occurred. He said, why, well, you have done all of that, you rascal. And he says, what are you doing here among all these honest men? And he ordered the, the guards to come and says, release this man. Get him away from these honest men. That he, and set him, just turn him loose. Get him out of here. And see, well, here's my point in that illustration. When we protect our innocence... We can really condemn ourselves. I'm innocent. I have not sinned. What have we done? We've just then condemned ourselves to hell. And, and so we, uh, 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 we need to respond. Or the, if you're here not saved today, you need to respond this way. Have mercy upon me, a sinner, O Lord. Have mercy upon me, a sinner. And then we'll know the king of kings forgiveness. 
So not only did Philip help this man understand he was a sinner, but number two, he showed this man Christ died for his sins. In verses 32 and 35, uh, you can read that again uh, just for the sake of time. I'll just have it pointed out there. But no matter what else you preach, if you don't tell people that Jesus Christ died for their sins, then you're not a missionary. You have not preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he preached how that Christ died for our sins. Um, do you understand here this morning that Jesus Christ took your place, took my place? All we like sheep, Isaiah wrote, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him, who? Jesus. Laid on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Now, you remember that verse from camp, right? Amen. Jesus took my sins and went to Calvary. And you know what I got in replacement of that, of my sins? The righteousness, his righteousness of Jesus Christ. I go to heaven, and that's what the gospel is. You say, oh, boy, that preacher, that's, that's so simple. And that's exactly right. It is simple. It, it's, it's so simple that a little child will see it. But maybe a college professor will stumble over it. I heard of a poor, uneducated woman who uh, really all she could do was wash clothes for a living. And uh, this was during the rough times of the years, and there was a, lo a, a, a lost skeptic who heard that she had got saved, this woman. And so he was going to uh, kind of berate her or just embarrass her. And he says, well, Betty, I hear you got religion last week. Tell me, what is it like being a saint? And uh, the woman responds, well, she said, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I know what a saint is. And he said, well, tell me what happened to you. Oh, she said. And she went on. She said, I learned of something called the grace of God and that Jesus died for me and I accepted him as my Savior and my Lord and he's forgiven me of all of my sins. He saved me. And oh, this skeptic said, he said, you're saved. He said, tell me, what does it feel like to be saved? And she said, well, I, I don't think I can explain it to you where you could understand it. But here's what she said. To me, it's as though I'm standing in Jesus' shoes and he's standing in mine. Well, how profound. Now, I don't believe a, a, theo, a theologian who has earned all kinds of degrees could explain it any better than that. I am standing in Jesus' shoes and he is standing in mind. Christ died for our sins. And so, listen, if you're here today without Jesus Christ, or maybe you're watching this video and you're not saved, I want to encourage you. I want you to hear this message that Jesus had for this Ethiopian eunuch and to hear and understand that Jesus Christ died for your sins. He died for you. Your sins are paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. And I, could, I would say all of us should respond by saying, Hallelujah, praise God, my sins are paid for. And the third thing that Philip taught this man is that he taught this man that salvation is by grace through faith. In verses 36 and 37, and um, let's, let's just go ahead. I don't think we read those this morning. Verse 36, and as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, and said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So they came to this place, and the Ethiopian eunuch is wondering about being baptized. And Philip had taught him that salvation is by grace through faith. And now it's so simple. Philip had taught him that you're a sinner. He, he understood that. He had taught him that Christ died for his sins. He had taught him that he was saved by faith or through by grace through faith, I should say. He couldn't, uh, and let me ask you, couldn't you teach that this morning? Uh, couldn't you teach that to somebody? It's something that simple, isn't it? It's, it's not complicated. You don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to have... Uh, a college degree, my, anybody could teach that. Um, and uh, it's a simple gospel message. It's so simple 
so glorious that we are saved by grace and uh, through faith as we trust the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's the reason why the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes it. Now, that's the reason Paul was silenced when they were beaten and thrown into prison. That's why he was able to tell that man, after those series of events that occurred there, that Philippian jailer, why he was able to tell him in Acts 16, 31, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Now let me ask you a question. Can a person know that they are saved? Absolutely they can know that. You're looking at a man this morning that knows they're saved. Now you might be here or thinking, well, Boy, preacher, you sure are awful cocky. You know, you're sure you sure to have a lot of confidence in yourself. And I would say to that, no, no. There's no confidence in this person. No, I, I, my confidence is in what Jesus Christ has done. My faith is in what Jesus Christ has done, what he's told me. And so I know I'm saved because salvation is by grace through faith. Now, if you're if you have your Bibles and and uh, I, I encourage you to bring your Bibles to church for sure. But uh, if you want to see something that will uh, bless your heart, just turn with me to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. I want you to see this. And let me show you what I'm talking about. How you can know that you're saved. And uh, look, at, look at Romans chapter 4. And we're just going to look at uh, the first part of that, Romans 4, 16. Romans 4, 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure. So I, I'm going to stop right there. It's of faith that it might be grace. To the end, the promise might be sure. Now, what in the world does that mean? Well, you see, if, if there were any other plan of salvation, then you couldn't be sure you're saved. For instance, suppose that God said, everybody who wants to get saved, you need to read a chapter of the Bible every day. Some people can't read. Some people, you know, just can't do it. Suppose God said, everybody who wants to be saved, you need to live a good life, a perfect life. Well, that knocks all of us out. None of us are perfect. We all already established the fact that we're all sinners. And, and so if these people who are depending upon their good works to get them to heaven... Uh, well, he said, if you're living good enough when you die, then you're going to go to heaven, they say. Uh, well, that's not Bible. Listen, if there's anybody who, who could stand up here today and tell us with, with all honesty of heart, I have never, I am not today, nor will I ever sin. No, there's nobody that could do that because all of us, not only in this room, but all across the world, we are all sinners. We've all come short of the glory of God. We're not perfect. We cannot stand up here and say such, such a thing as that. And so God demands perfection. He does. Suppose, you know, some people say, well, I'm pretty good. I'm better than others. And that I, probably all of us could find others that we're better than. And But God demands perfection. Suppose you're hanging over a, a cliff, over a thousand foot cliff. You're hanging on that cliff. Uh, let's, let's just make it a little bit even deeper. Two thousand feet. You're hanging over jagged rocks and no chance if you fall that you'll survive. And you're suspended by a chain that has a hundred links on that. Uh, uh, Ninety-nine of those links are forged steel, but one link is made out of crepe paper. Boy, I tell you, just one link? I mean, 99 of them are strong and sure, but how safe are you? You're not safe at all. And we have a proverb, proverb, you all have heard this, a chain is no stronger than its what? Weakest link. And so if one link in that chain depends upon you, you can never be sure. If I'm saying to any of us, we couldn't be sure. Just one link. And I mean, it's, it's not... Don't, don't, don't misunderstand. It's not you and God. It's not me and God. It's all God. He's done it all. And I have nothing, but I don't work in order to be saved. I work because I am saved. 
If by grace, then there's no more works. Otherwise, now listen, otherwise grace is no more grace. Uh, the minute that I add works to it, then grace is no more grace. Now suppose that, uh, let's say, let's suppose Brother Noah here. I mean, he's going to be rich and famous. Won't be long. And he gets there, he gets to that place where he's just rich and famous. He comes to me and says, Pastor, I, I love you as my pastor. I want to do something for you. I want to buy you a brand new Mercedes Benz. I, I knew you were really looking at that. And I said, yeah, I, boy, I like that. And Noah, listen, by the way, I want one with all the trimmings. I mean, everything, everything. And uh, 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 that car that will not only park itself, but that will even drive itself. That car that will have all the gadgets that they can provide. And so, uh, you know, I, I tell him that, uh, uh, that I appreciate that. That's exciting. I mean, after all, if he's going to buy me that Mercedes, I want the best. And so, uh, no, you know, it says, you know, that's, I don't want any ordinary Mercedes. It's got to be the best. And, and, and Noah says, yeah, Pastor, I, I agree. I want to do the best. I want to get you the best. I want a, a, a fine Mercedes Benz. And that's only going to cost maybe around $150,000. I, I could go a lot more. So I'm not really going for the best, but it's a really nice car. I, I ought to compromise a little bit. And so, uh, but I don't want a cheap one. And he says, now, Pastor, that's, that's for you. That's for you. This car, I'm going to spend that money. He's rich. He's famous. And I'm going to give that car to you. I said, great. That's exciting. I'm, I appreciate it. But no, I can't just let you take all of that, that expense. And I want to help you out. Here's a, here's a quarter. And I give him my quarter. And then somebody sees me driving the car and says, Pastor, my, that's a beautiful car. Where'd you get that car? Well, me and Noah bought this car. And, and you know, all I did was give a quarter. Here he spends, what, 149000 whatever it comes out to. And I'm trying to take credit for it. And I, boy, well, that to be a slap in the face of the giver. And, uh, uh, and I, I, if I just say that, and if you try to do that with Jesus Christ, you add your two bits to it. You say, oh, yeah, Jesus and me did it together. No, we didn't. He did it all. Uh, we, we try to add our little bit of effort, and we, it's just like a slap in the face of Jesus Christ. You didn't do enough, Jesus. I need to do my two bits worth. And that's really all that it amounts to. The minute that you add your works to it, you have destroyed the idea of grace. But if it be of works, the Bible says, it is no more of grace. Romans 11, six, 11, verse 6. It is by grace, then it cannot be by works. If it's by works, then it cannot be by grace. Now, those of you who are trying to be saved through good works, it's no wonder that you don't have the assurance of your salvation. The Bible says, therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end, uh, the promise might be sure. And I know this morning I'm going to heaven. I know many of you as what well have testified of that as well. But I wouldn't trust the best 15 minutes of my life that I've ever lived. I wouldn't to get me to heaven. The best. I uh, did you the, listen? Not the best I've ever lived, much less the worst 15 minutes. But I'm going to heaven not because of Randy Miller. I'm going to heaven by the grace of God. And so are you. Now, these people get all confused about this thing. They say, oh, no, no, let me tell you that it's grace and works. Grace and works. And they go on and they explain this and say, it's just like a rowboat. You get in a rowboat and, and there's one of those oars there. You're going to cross the stream. And you uh, pull on one of those oars and that oar is called works. And you just start pulling on that oar, what's going to happen? Well, you're just going to go in circles. And then as you get in that boat, you're going to say, well, I'm just going to paddle our row on this other oar. And that one's faith. And you're paddling, and you're just going to go in circles. But if you get in that uh, row boat, and you grab both of those oars, faith and works, and you paddle together, boy, you'll get right across that stream. And that's how uh, a lot of them explain faith plus works. Now that sounds good, it sounds logical, but there's a fatal flaw in that. We're not just crossing a stream in a rowboat. We're going to heaven. And I'm not going to heaven in a rowboat. Praise God. And I'm, I'm going to heaven, as the Bible says, by the grace of God. 
And if by grace, then it's no more of works. Now, um, listen, uh, Philip preached to this man, and what he preached to him was the same message that Paul preached to that uh, Philippian jailer in Acts 16, 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Now, that's what people have to understand. It is simple, but it's not always easy to swallow. When Philip got up there and said, you understand what you're reading to the Ethiopian eunuch? He said uh, he helped him to see what, that he was a sinner. He helped him understand this. He helped him uh, understand that salvation is by grace through faith. Now, there's one last thing. Not only must the missionary answer God's call, not only must the missionary acknowledge God's message, but number three, they must act, act upon God's orders. Now, I'm going to wrap this up here, but if you read the story as you go on through here in Acts chapter 8, you'll find that Philip got this man baptized in this water, and he baptized him as a believer in Jesus Christ. And so this man had a believer's baptism. You've heard me use that phrase many a time. And for you to see the Great Commission, it, it tells us this, that, not, uh, that it, it's, it's not enough just to preach Christ, it's not enough just to preach the message, that we need to obey Christ, do what he's told us to do. The Great Commission, go ye therefore and teach all nations, teaching them the gospel and baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And so when you are baptized, what, is, what happens here? It's your way of showing openly and publicly, publicly that you have been saved. It's an outward expression of an inward change, a transformation. But you must be saved in order to be biblically baptized. And if you haven't believed first with all of your heart, you're not ready to be baptized. Uh, there in verses 36 and 37, we read that. If you believe, you're ready. If not, you're not ready. And so true baptism follows true salvation every time in the Word of God. Let me add this. There was never, ever in the Bible an infant that was baptized. Never. There was never, ever in the Bible someone baptized that was not saved first. And that is the divine order. Because it's an illustration, it's an outward expression, a public uh, a testimony of what's happened in your heart. And so when this man was baptized, the Bible says he went on his way rejoicing. Did you know that oftentimes in the Bible you see baptism and joy linked together? They were bapti baptized and they rejoiced. And the reason that some Christians today, who they claim they're saved, but maybe the reason they don't have joy, they don't have that uh, uh, real, they're not able to rejoice because they haven't been obedient, maybe in baptism. I Just a thought. And so now, if we're real missionaries, listen, God's calling you today. If you're saved, he's been calling you from the moment you got saved, and you haven't answered the call. How rude is that? Some of you get upset. If you knew, what do they call it, ghosting? Is that, what is that? Yeah. Is that right? Something like that, where they, people just ignore their call. We probably, most of us have done that one time or another. We're, now we have that caller ID, we're able, oh, it's that person. Now that can wait. <laughs> and, but God's been calling. Have we responded that way? Well, I, I know, Lord, I know what you want me to do, but I don't have time now. I've got a lot of things to do. Answer the call. Acknowledge God's message. Preach Christ under the people around you. And then act on God's orders. Do what God has told you to do. We will be doers of the word. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed. Just a, a moment here, we're going to have an invitation. I ask you to be that doer. You've heard the truth. You've understood the truth. Maybe you haven't answered the call. God's been calling you. Maybe he's calling you to go across the street to your neighbor. Maybe he's calling you to talk to your friend at school or your friend at work. God is calling. Are you answering? Are you willing to go? Wherever you lead, Lord, I'll go. Father, you have your way. 
I especially pray if there's anyone here that's never been born again, may they come and get saved today. And I pray for every Christian. Lord, may they get serious about this thing and living for you. May they answer your call. May they do like Philip and immediately obey and, and respond to your uh, uh, call on their life. And so you have your way with each and every heart here today, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.